other hand, when philosophizing by the light of nature flows along the more even course of sound common sense, it offers at its very best only a rhetoric of trivial truths. And if reproached with the insignificance of these truths, it assures us in reply that their meaning and fulfillment reside in its heart and must surely be present in the hearts of others too, since it reckons to have said the last word once the innocence of the heart, the purity of conscience, and such like have been mentioned. These are ultimate truths to which no exception can be taken and beyond which nothing more can be demanded. It is just the point, however, that the best should not remain in the recesses of what is inner, but should be brought out of these depths into the light of day. But it would be better by far to spare oneself the effort of bringing forth ultimate truths of that kind, for they have long since been available in, in catechisms or popular sayings, for example. It is not difficult to grasp such vague and misleading truths, or even to show that the mind in believing them is also aware of their very opposite. When it labors to extricate itself from the bewilderment this sets up, it falls into fresh contradictions and may very well burst out with the assertion that the question is settled, that so-and-so is the truth, and that the other views are sophistries. For sophistry is a slogan used by ordinary common sense against educated reason, just as the expression visionary dreaming sums up once and for all what philosophy means to those who are ignorant of it. Since the man of common sense makes this appeal to feeling, to an oracle within his breast, he is finished and done with anyone who does not agree. He has only to explain that he has nothing more to say to anyone who does not find and feel the same in himself. In other words, he tramples underfoot the roots of humanity. For it is the nature of humanity to press onward to agreement with others. Human nature only really exists in an achieved community of minds. The anti-human the merely animal consists in staying within the sphere of feeling and being able to communicate only at that level. The sound common sense that Hegel is criticizing in this section and continuing on to criticize in the next section as we come to the end of the preface of the phenomenology is something that you could come up with synonyms for in our own time. We don't often use the term right thinking, although that was uh, you know, a common term in the last century. Right thinking means not necessarily thinking conservatively on the right, but thinking along the lines that a good, decent person would do. So in our own contemporary society, there are versions of it where, you know, a uh, person who's right thinking thinks the way that somebody on the right or a conservative does. There's also all sorts of ways in which right thinking is done from the perspective of the left, you know. Things are simply taken for granted. And of course you can find people on, on all sorts of other extremes doing that as well. Um, Hegel is using the term common sense and this was an idea that had become uh, quite attractive in, in the century and a half or two centuries before he's writing the phenomenology. Remember, we're separated from this work by about 200 years, and it's interesting because this is a work that is intensely critical of modernity, of you know the processes of modernization, uh, but it also thinks that they're, in a certain sense, inescapable, that the world has is, is been changed radically. And it's happened through things like the dissemination of newspapers, through the creation of what Jürgen Habermas has called the public sphere um, in, in his early work discussing that, that particular concept. And, and Hegel is really attuned to this. We're going to see him in the next section actually talking about how people can avoid doing philosophy by just getting, you know, the latest journals and newspapers. Now that's something that's new. And what, is, what does this have to do with common sense? Well, you know, you might think of it as, as sort of a lowering of things to a certain common denominator. So that communication can take place and everybody can have some things more or less taken for granted. It's almost like having your own little cant or language that you communicate in, a culture or a milieu of ideas. Um, and so going back to the right thinking idea, when you have such a milieu 
there are right ways to think and there are wrong ways to think. And in, in the modern period, as and we're going to see this getting played out in the phenomenology, particularly in the later sections, as freedom is spreading, which is a, a distinctive, it's not a distinctively modern phenomenon, but the way in which freedom is spreading, Hegel thinks, is distinctively modern. The, the democratization, we could say, of freedom. As it's spreading, people are liberating themselves and their allegiances and their consciousness from previous forms of authority, from, from institutions to which they felt that they they owed some deference. Now what comes along to replace that? Well, you know, the Enlightenment and the, the whole modern movement of thought was to say reason. But reason by itself doesn't always get you where you want to go. We've seen Hegel criticize the philosophy of the understanding and how it ends up sort of in a, a type of skepticism almost, a, a futility. A, I can argue against anything. Well, what, what else could, you know, really satisfy what it is that we human beings need as intellectual creatures? Common sense. There you've got something that's a little bit humbler, but also more widespread. It reminds me of Descartes and, and his saying, he didn't actually believe this one bit when he said it, but it had great rhetorical force that, you know, good sense is, is so widely distributed. His evidence for that was nobody really asks for more than they already have. Um, now, that's not actually a good argument in favor of, of that assertion, but there is this notion that, look, you don't need to have studied philosophy or some other technical subject. You don't have to have got, undergone some sort of formation. You can just be a human being, and provided you can free yourself of your biases, and, you know, pay attention to things with relatively clear eyes and, and connect up with your fellow human beings. You can make sense out of anything. As the English say, you can muddle through it. So the question is, is this common sense really adequate? And Hegel is looking at how do, how do people actually reason along these, these lines? How do they think through it? So he says that it deploys a rhetoric of trivial truths. Now, when we hear the term rhetoric, we often don't, don't think of everything that it comprises. Um, in Hegel's day, rhetoric was still a subject that you would, you would study. Why would you study it? Well, you know, in the Middle Ages, it was actually part of the, um, the trivium. And it, it degenerated. It became, you know, a formal subject that, that could be studied. But it, people were still using it. And the notion was that there was a a tradition of, of inquiry, and it was primarily into figuring out, um, you know, certain figures of speech, commonplaces, how to get emotions involved, all those sorts of things. If you, if you study Aristotle's rhetoric, you'll see uh, the beginnings of, of that study. Um, <clears throat> now, a rhetoric means a sort of array of things that you can say. So Cicero, great rhetorician, great theorist of rhetoric, said that what the, the rhetorer or the orator really needs is copia, that is, a abundance of things which they can, can talk about you know, competently, not necessarily at an expert level, but at least competently, you know, at least enough to get other people to, to buy into what it is that they're saying. <clears throat> so when we talk about a rhetoric in this sense, we don't just mean persuasion, we don't just mean rhetorical force, we mean having a bunch of commonplaces. Now, what are commonplaces? I should actually put that term up here. Um, trivial truths or commonplaces. Well, let's think of some contemporary ones. These are the things that you can use in argument or in discussion with people, which is, is still perhaps argument if you're trying to make claims and advance them and defend them, or consider <clears throat> the appropriateness of your, your you know, interlocutor's claims, you're really engaged in, in, in argument or reasoning together. Um, it's all good. Now that's a stupid thing that people say all the time. And you might say, well, you know, that's just a cliché. It doesn't have any meaning to it anymore. No, it actually does have a lot of meaning. 
it has a lot of force, otherwise people wouldn't be using it in reality shows uh, to, you know, sort of stop conversations, to, um, you know, move the conversation to another place. It wouldn't be happening like that if it weren't a commonplace. Or, you know, does the end really justify the means? That, that's, you know, always poses the question, and it's only asked in cases where the interlocutor is trying to claim that, no, in this case, the end which is, you know, supposed to be something good, does not justify the means, which is supposed to be something bad. So people make recourse to these all the time. Can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs, another, another cliche, another commonplace that people can relate to. Um, notice that these don't always have to be in the form of statements. They can be questions. They can be interjections. They can be all sorts of things. Uh, just do it. They could be imperatives, right, uh, like, like the Nike campaign. Now, a rhetoric of trivial truths, these commonplaces, you can use them with people who are not particularly profound thinkers, people who are just going to operate according to common sense, because Hegel's saying that's more or less what common sense consists in, this kind of inter-tissue, this, you know, connectivity in language and in culture of all these different cliches and, and commonplaces. Now, when you push on that, and you say, well, what do you actually mean by this? When you, when you play the part of Socrates, as he did in his own society, what happens? People often can't explain. I, I'm not quite sure what I did mean by that. What they do say is, well, I had the best intentions. I, I mean something good. You just have to go along with me. So there's an appeal to something common, something articulate, and then there is this sort of retreat inward. The meaning must reside in what Hegel calls the heart, die Herz, right? And by that, what he means is internally to the person. It's, it's in my intentions. It's in my mind. We, we don't have to you know, necessarily pick heart with its romantic connotations. But the general idea is that a person who's saying these sorts of things, they, they more or less know what they mean. They're just having a hard time expressing it. And, you know, that's because some things are difficult to, to express, um, but you just have to kind of feel your way into it. You have to feel what it is that they're saying. That's, you know, a great slang expression. You feeling me? Uh, as opposed to, are you understanding what I'm saying to you? Are you feeling me? Are you having the same affective experience as, as I am or as I want to portray you as having? Now, what's the problem with this? Well, there's a superficiality to this. Hegel, as far as the inwardness, he says, um, you know, common sense says that the meaning and fulfillment of these cliches reside in its heart, must surely be present in the hearts of others too, since it reckons to have said the last word once the innocence of the heart, the purity of the conscience, and such like have been mentioned. And again, we're talking about sort of the phrases of right-thinking humanity within different contexts. You wouldn't talk about the purity of conscience these days because nobody would know what you're talking about. But we have our own cliches in our own culture that we appeal to on, on the same sort of basis. And then he says, these are ultimate truths to which no exception can be taken, beyond which nothing can be demanded. So their conversation enders. They say, look, you know, you just have to buy into it. And Hegel says, here's the problem. The best should not remain in the recesses <clears throat> of what is inner. If you can't explain it, you don't actually know it. If you can't explain it, it's probably because it's really fine-spun BS that you bought into and you're trying to get other people to buy into as well. It sounds good, it may actually work in your culture, but it's not real philosophy, is what Hegel's saying. So he says, um, what we ought to be doing is trying to develop real philosophy. You don't need to do this. Why do this? Why write a philosophy book that's just a bunch of aphorisms? Uh, why write self-help books? Why write leadership books? Why write so many of these things that actually, you know, if you were going to investigate the, the topic, um, you would realize there, there's a lot of work that has to be done here if it's going to be genuine, rigorous philosophy or science. 
But there's, it's really easy to write a book that makes people feel okay, provided they don't think about it too much, provided they think that they're thinking, but they're not really thinking deeply about it. As a matter of fact, like I put here, all of this can already be found available. It's already there for you. You don't need to reinvent that wheel. Hegel talks about catechisms. Again, we don't, you know, not a term that we really use unless we're doing religious instruction, but we have all sorts of other things. Listicles. Great example. Uh, you know, we have all these articles, all these blog posts about, you know, what you should be doing in the workplace and how to improve your life and how to unscrew up your relationships and, you know, anything from spirituality to neuroscience to whether we should, you know, try to colonize Mars or not. And you can put it all into a nice, easy to read bullet point form. Well, that's exactly what Hegel's talking about here, as what common sense tries to put over as being philosophy. And again, you know, he doesn't have a problem with common sense as such. He doesn't have a problem with rhetoric. What he has is a problem with this pretending to be genuine philosophy. So he says, you know, when you grasp, try to grasp these vague and misleading truths or show that the mind believing in them is also aware of their very opposite, that is, when you're doing dialectical philosophy, it gets them all confused. So to common sense, real philosophy, dialectical philosophy, appears to be sophistry. Why? Because the sophist is the person who can argue on both sides and can make the weaker argument appear stronger. And what appears to be weaker to the, to the crowd, to the man of common sense, to the person who's you know, only got this going for them, only has practice in that, the argument that appears stronger to them may not actually be the stronger argument. As a matter of fact, the, the whole progression of the dialectic that Hegel is charting out in this book is a case where what, what is the stronger argument for a while turns out to have yet a stronger rival that it's displaced by. And then, you know, the Aufgehebung takes place, the sublation or the transcending of it. Um, Sophistry, like he says, is a slogan used by ordinary common sense against educated reason, just as the expression visionary dreaming sums up once and for all what philosophy means to those who are ignorant of it. Um, will philosophy be able to convince these people? Probably not. It does have the last laugh in that they don't really know what they're doing and they're not going to remain within the grand stream of humanity. Um, it's quite you know, interesting to, to read old popular magazines from just half a century ago and to remark on what they took to be common wisdom and how far we have moved away from that and then do that with, with stuff later, you know, further back and now transpose that into our own time and think about 99% of the stuff that we actually read in popular magazines and newspapers on the internet uh, that we see on TV and think, you know, a lot of that is stuff where the very assumptions that are built into it are things that other people are going to, so to speak, call bullshit on later on. Now, what does Hegel conclude with here? He says, in a sense, this common sense attitude, it looks like it's being, you know, very homey and, you know, humble and reaching out to the other, but it's actually kind of anti-human. How so? Because it just appeals to feeling. And by merely appealing to feeling rather than our intellects, it appears to our, it appeals to our intellect in a superficial way, in a way that works so long as you don't push it very far. But when the intellect actually gets some traction and starts, you know, pumping away, it, it outstrips common sense. To be human, to be genuinely human, means to be able to be elevated out of the realm of merely feeling and mere repetition of catchphrases and cliches. Or even, you know, puttering around, bricolage, as the postmodernists like to say, with that sort of thing. Humanity involves genuine communication. This seems to be communication, but it's not authentic communication. Authentic communication requires that you try to attain agreement with others, not that you take it as a starting point. 
So he says, um, it is the nature of humanity to press onward to agreement with others. Not something that you just take as, you know, <clears throat> we already have agreement and we're going to work on the basis of that agreement. Agreement is something that comes down the line. It says, human nature only really exists in an achieved community of minds. For us to know what human nature really is, the implication here, is for us to do so with others in a community, not of bodies, not of just hanging out next to each other, not of World of Warcraft, or, you know, um, playing music together, or being in the same university or anything like that, but a community of minds, a community in which people are engaging with each other. They can be engaging in terms of music, gaming, all sorts of other things, cooking even. But what's, what's necessary uh, as an element is something, doesn't have to be called philosophy, but something that plays the role of philosophy. Lacking that, we don't have a genuine community of minds. We have a community of interest, you might say, but not a community of minds. <clears throat> and so this is what we're trying to attain. And in the process, we're going to get to know these others. But that's a story for another time. Should anyone ask for a royal road to science, there is no more easygoing way than to rely on sound common sense. And for the rest, in order to keep up with the times and with advances in philosophy, to read reviews of philosophical works, perhaps even to read their prefaces and first paragraphs. For these preliminary pages give the general principles on which everything turns and the reviews, as well as providing historical accounts, also provide the critical appraisal, which being a judgment stands high above the work judged. This common road can be taken in casual dress, but the high sense for the eternal, the holy, the infinite strides along in the robes of a high priest on a road that is from the first no road but has immediate being as its center, the genius of profound original ideas and lofty flashes of inspiration. But just as profundity of this kind still does not reveal the source of essential being, so too these skyrockets of inspiration are not yet the Empyrean. True thoughts and scientific insight are only to be won through the labor of the notion. Only the notion can produce the universality of knowledge which is neither common vagueness nor the inadequacy of ordinary common sense, but a fully developed, perfected cognition. Not the uncommon universality of a reason whose talents have been ruined by indolence and the conceit of genius, but a truth ripened to its properly matured form so as to be capable of being the property of all self-conscious reason. In section 70, Hegel is continuing his criticisms of common sense, and he's going to draw them to, to a close, and then we'll take it up again much later in the phenomenology. He's also engaging in a little bit of, of play and humor that I want to call your attention to as he's doing this. He talks about the royal road to science. And let's remember, of course, when he's talking about science, he's not just talking about, you know, people in, in lab coats and playing with chemicals or people putting other people in MRIs or let alone journals about science, that sort of thing. He's talking about a systematic, developed conception of things that not only takes into account the things that we observe and act upon and understand, but also ourselves, our role in the process and the sweep of history, you know, human development, and where we fit into that. So, you know, it's science is not something without a past and a future and, and opportunities of the present. So the royal road to science. What would the royal road be? Today, we would call it the interstate. Or, you know, whatever the equivalent is in, in other countries. Here in the United States, it's the interstate. These, these massive highways that were built uh, ultimately, you know, to transport military materials, but they've been used just incredibly for commercial traffic and even, you know, leisure traffic. 
A royal road is one which, not necessarily providing a shortcut, but the straightest, clearest, most unimpeded path to where it is that you want to go. So, if, for example, Freud and on the interpretation of dreams, he's going to use that same metaphor of the royal road. Dreams are the royal road to the unconscious. If you want, if you want to understand the unconscious, it's not as if you can't do it by other means. You can observe the, the patient, you can do free association, but dreams are the best way into it. So what is Hegel trying to get at here? He's saying that for, for many people in his contemporary culture, there, there's a royal road to science, a shorter path, a straighter path, and what does it consist in? He says, um, sound common sense. Rely on that. And for the rest, because you need some supplement, sound common sense won't give you everything that you need. We've already seen some of the problems with it. You can supplement it by reading. What a wonderful world we live in. I mean, think about how this would play out in our contemporary society with respect to education is available everywhere on the internet. Well, yes and no. I mean, this is a great example right here. You can watch videos of this. Ultimately, you probably do need to read and think about Hegel because you're not going to get it all from watching me up in front of the chalkboard or sitting in my chair, you know, reading from the text. That's not the same thing as you putting in the work to, to make Hegel your own, to enter into a conversation with him. I'm just sort of an interpreter or translator or, you know... Um, Think of the guy who's introducing you at the party. Hey, I want, I want you to get to know this guy over here. Um, what, what's the supplementing going on here? So Hegel talks about two things, but we could expand this to include all sorts of other ideas as well. He talks about, if you want to know what's going on in philosophy, if you want to know what's really important, just read reviews of the articles. Read reviews of the work. Gee, don't read Kant's critique of pure reason. Why spend all that time on that? My God, you'll, you just destroy your mind trying to figure out what he's saying. Just read somebody's review. That'll tell you the most important stuff in it, and it'll also help you out because it'll tell you what's right in it and what's wrong in it. You don't have to think that out for yourself. You don't have to figure all that for, you know, on your own. You know, you got professionals to handle that sort of thing. Just like, you know, why do you need to worry about what you eat at a restaurant? Just read what the restaurant critics say about the place, you know, what's good on the menu, what's not. Or, you know, you want a more personal thing? Ask your, your server, ask the chef, what do you recommend tonight? I can't really trust my own taste because it's not developed. I haven't put in the work to do it. I'm going to rely on somebody else's reviews. Well, I mean, you can do that, and I'm not saying that reviews are not useful at all. Uh, oftentimes, uh, reviewers may, if they're very good, call attention to things that the um, philosopher, if we want to think about movies, you know, the, the filmmaker or the writer him, himself or herself didn't actually catch, because when we produce things, there's often a lot more involved than we're consciously aware of. But a review does not substitute for the work, does it? So Hegel goes a little bit further. You know, if you're going to read the work, just read like, you know, the first couple chapters or maybe just the preface. You can look at the table of contents. That'll tell you if it's worth reading or not. It'll tell you what it's about. Maybe look at the index. <laughs> and we can, I've seen people do this, actually, in determining whether they should read a book or not, a book of secondary literature. Let me look at the index and see if it cites the people that I'm interested in hearing about. And, okay, there's about eight citations of Aristotle. That must be a pretty good book. Well, you don't know that, right? I mean, this is quite silly. So he says, um, These preliminary pages give the general principles on which everything turns and the reviews, as well as providing historical accounts so you know where things fit in. You know, This is one of the beefs I have with people who always want to say, Oh, I love Durant's story of philosophy. Yeah, it is a good story. It's not an accurate story in every respect. A lot of these secondary works are, you know, pretty one-sided. They got interested in this over here and this over here, and that's what they wrote about, and then they totally ignored the other stuff over here that's a little bit more important. Good secondary literature is a bit more balanced than that. 
Um, providing critical appraisal, which being a judgment stands high above the work judged. So, you know, when you're, when you're reading a, a major work of philosophy, you don't want to just take it for granted. You don't want to read Descartes and say, well, you know, Descartes, he's an important guy, so he must be right. You do want to form your own judgments about it. But you want to form your own judgments. You don't necessarily just want to import them from whoever happens to be an influential philosopher at the time or, you know, pick some secondary work. Um, you know, there's a lot of great Descartes scholars who are worth reading, but you want to actually assess their judgments on your own, which means you actually need to read the work. You actually need to engage Descartes uh, yourself if you want to be able to appreciate what they're saying about it. Um, I realize that sounds like an awful lot of work. Now, he says something else here that's kind of funny. So he talks about the high sense for the, and he's got a bunch of, you know, things here. He talks about the, the eternal, the holy, the infinite. Now, again, those were the sort of things that, that um, people talked about a lot in Hegel's time. We don't have quite so much talk about those now. But we have our own the dot, dot, dots that people are constantly um, on about, like the singularity. What's going to happen with the singularity? or um, neuroscience, or, um, you know, the democracy agenda. That one's pretty much in the tank now after what's happened in the Middle East over the last 10 years. But you, you get the idea. Liberation, um, overcoming of, of, of this, overcoming of that. It seems like you can't become a philosopher, by the way, and this is a total digression, you can't become a philosopher without coining a few catchphrases. Deconstruction. The other. Everybody talks about the other, right? Um, externalism, which means a million different things in a million different contexts. But, like he's talking about, the high sense for these, you know, big ideas, big catchphrases strides along the road in the robes of a high priest. Now notice he's not saying the eternal is walking down the road in the robes of a high priest. He's saying this kind of feeling for it, this kind of, I'm one of the people who, who does this kind of thing. And boy, if you go to philosophy conferences, you'll see plenty of people like this uh, who, who are, you know, they, they think that they're really hot stuff because they talk about this particular thing or go to a cultural studies conference or go to... Well, just watch TED, you know, watch TED Talks. A lot of these people are, are so, you know, full of the eternal, full of neuroscience, full of whatever, that um, they really think that they, you know, they've got the, thing, the thumb on the pulse. Um, now, here's where it gets really interesting. Hegel, like, draws everything to a grinding halt, and he says, that's not a road. This isn't actually a road to anything. It's just, like he says, um, immediate being as its center. It takes the genius of profound original ideas and lofty flashes of inspiration. And then he says, that's all real nice, but it's just smoke and mirrors. It's not really giving you essential being. He talks about these skyrockets of inspiration are not yet the Empyrean. They're not yet the, the heavens, the, the, what we want to see. True thoughts and scientific insight are only to be won through something else, something else that Hegel wants to direct us to. Only this can produce the universality of knowledge, which is neither common vagueness nor the inadequacy of only co uh, ordinary common sense, but a fully developed, perfected. Perfected means brought to its fulfillment cognition. Not the uncommon universality of a reason whose talents have been ruined by indolence and the conceit of genius. Indolence means laziness, laying around, just reading reviews instead of actually doing the work, just watching, you know, uh, simplified videos on things rather than actually reading the text and thinking about them, um, relying on spark notes and Wikipedia, that sort of thing. A, troop, a truth ripened to its properly matured form so as to be capable of being the property of all self-conscious reason. That's what we're aiming at. What's required for that? One word I've been leaving out here. What Hegel is called, what's translated here as the notion, the begriff, the concept. We've seen a lot about this. We'll see a lot more about this. 
But this is something that goes beyond mere common sense, beyond merely you know, reading summaries or schemas of, of things, and actually goes to, if we want to use uh, you know, Husserl's language, to the things themselves. And doesn't just like go to them and like look at them, but grapples with them, tries to make them their own, tries to think about what's my role in relation to this, including other things being other persons, including other things being historical eras, being great concepts like freedom or, you know, necessity or progress. So that's what Hegel offers instead of this rather, you know, seductive high road that turns out not to be a road at all, but really just a cul-de-sac.